So, the topic today is Rovdu, or it should be Rovdu. It's, it's taught in high school, it's taught in 101 and 102. So, we won't spend more time on it than necessary. At the same point, there are things students sometimes struggle with, so we don't want to go through it too fast and leave anyone uh, confused. So, just as a brief reminder of what this is, the Cartesian plane is a way of visually representing data points, x comma y. And the data that you're visually representing would be two related numbers. Like maybe you're looking at a child's age and his height, or something like that. Um, but you've got this data point, you want to visually represent it. The Cartesian plane, named after René Descartes, maybe you've seen rectangular plane instead. But it's two number lines that hit each other at a right angle. And because these are number lines, they've got the ticks on them. And these number lines, the place they intersect, it's called the origin. And they intersect at their zeros. So one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. The vertical number line counts up vertically. Not negative two. What am I writing? Negative one, negative two, negative three negative four. And if you have a point that you want to represent, I, I'll just make something up, say the point uh, two comma four. Uh, this is no longer that, it's just a point. Well, this first number is x, the second number is y, and what that corresponds to is this horizontal line, which is called the x-axis, and this vertical line, which is called the y-axis. So in this example, x is 2, and y is 4. And these are like map coordinates. Or if you ever played Battleship, maybe that's a very obsolete reference by now, but you'd give a horizontal coordinate and a vertical coordinate, and that's what this point x comma y is doing. So it's relatively rare that you just have one point that you want to represent. Usually you've got a bunch of data. I mean, if I unscribble this out, the, one of the beauties of a whiteboard is that you can unscribble stuff. But I mean, you're probably looking at a child's height over time right? You know how hot, tall they are as they grow up. You probably don't just have this one data point. 
And this being an algebraic class, um, the relationships that we're going to look at are mainly going to be mathematical, and they're going to be given by form to those. And these form to those in general are going to have the familiar form, or the hopefully familiar form, y equals something. Thing. So just maybe y equals x squared plus 1, let's say. And there are an infinite number of values of x and y that satisfy this relationship. So 0 comma 1 satisfies this relationship because 1 equals 0 squared plus 1. You take this x value and you take the y value and you plug them in and you get a true statement. Um, but also 5 comma 2, um, because, wrong, I got those reversed, sorry about that, 2 comma 5, because if you let x be a 2, 2 squared plus 1 is 5. So pretty much any equation that we're going to look at in this class anyway has an infinite number of solutions. Well, any equation like this, like y equals something, any equation with both the variables in. So as far as visually representing this equation. I mean, if there are an infinite number of solutions, we can't just dot them down one by one. Unfortunately, um, again, at least in the context of this class, the equations we're going to look at are going to have, when we graph their solutions, they're going to be smooth curves. So instead of drawing an infinite number of points one by one, clearly not a very viable thing to do, we can just draw the curve. But that, that raises the question of how. How did I know that y equals was x squared plus 1 looks like this and not something else. There are kind of two answers to this. And this first answer is not maybe the most satisfying answer. But you might just have pre-knowledge. You might have taken um, algebra in high school, and you might remember that x squared plus 1 is a quadratic, and it's going to look something like what I drew on the whiteboard. But if you don't have that pre-knowledge, there's technology. And I am I am a believer in using technology when we have it. I am not uh, of the camp that we should be doing everything by hand in this uh, year 2023. So in terms of technology, you have a few options, but maybe the most um, obvious option is a graphing calculator.
activator. So I asked you to, I, well, I said you need those. Um, I'm afraid I'm led you astray, though. If you went to the library, they didn't tell me this, but they moved all of the graphing calculators. So now Stacy in that room opposite us is the one who's holding on to that. But, um, but let's look at a graphing calculator, a TI-83 or a TI-84, even a TI-89, they all look basically the same. They look something like this. So let's run through graphing on a calculator, and let's run through some of the pitfalls or some of the complications that might arise, even though we do have this powerful technology available to us. So graphing is done up here, this upper left button, y equals. And the first thing to notice, I mean, as you're looking at this screen, I wish I could, I don't know any way to zoom in on it. So I apologize if it's a little small for those of you in the back of the room. But you see y sub 1 equals. So our calculator is only going to do what we need it to do when the equation is in this form, y equals something. If your y's and your x's are mixed together, you're going to have to do something else. And I'll show you another bit of software as well. But we need our equation to look like this, y equals something. And now you've got your variable button here. And you probably know, I mean, it's common to use variables other than x and y in word problems, like the area of a circle in terms of its radius, you'd probably say a equals pi r squared. You'd probably use A and R instead of X and Y. Well, that's not an option on your calculator. Your variables are going to be called Y and X. And give me a second. I feel like I must be a way. Ooh, that's much worse. Uh, wow, I mean, I'm just hiding stuff and I am not meaning to. I guess this really is the most zoomed in this thing's going to get. Um, this button up here to the right of the green alpha button is your variable button. And as I say, that variable is always going to be X. So y1 equals x. And then you just type in the equation you want. So we want x squared plus 1. And it might take you some time, if you haven't used these since high school or whatever, to sort of learn where everything is on the calculator. But here's the variable button. There's a square button down here. There's also a general power button. So we can just create the square like that. Or we can type y equals x, press the caret button, and then enter 2. Either way. The plus button is down here. The one button, the, all of the number buttons are here. And there's a button graph in the upper right. We press it, 
the graph is generated. So at its heart, that's, that's what graphing on our calculator is. But there are a few um, comments I want to make. Maybe before I make comments, I should ask if there are any questions. Then comment or slash concern one. You have to be careful because your calculator will follow the order of operation. Parentheses, exponentials, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And this gives a lot of students problems when we're trying to look at fractions. When we're trying to look at something like y equals x minus 3 divided by x plus 1, let's say. Our calculator is perfectly capable of generating this. But if you enter it in thoughtlessly, x minus 3 divided by x plus 1, you're going to get the wrong graph. And the reason you're going to get the wrong graph is that your calculator is going to see this division here, this 3 and this x separated by a division symbol. And it's going to think you're doing the division first. And if you look at what's actually happening here, first, we're doing this subtraction, then we're doing this addition. The division is the last thing that we're doing. So your calculator will, I mean, it will follow PEMDAS. Your calculator isn't making a mistake, but it's not doing what you want it to do. And I think the reason that, um, that this throws so many students is we're really used to our calculator just spitting up an error message when we screw up on it. And your calculator isn't going to give you an error message. Your calculator is going to just give you the graph and you it's up to you to recognize that you enter things incorrectly. So what's the solution? Well, it's this P in PEMDAS. If you put it something in parentheses, your calculator will do it first. So before any division happens, we want to do that subtraction. And before any division happens, we want to do that addition. And putting those parentheses there will ensure that our calculator, which follows PEMDAS and will do the parentheses first, does what we actually want it to do. And this is just a good habit to get in. If you've got a fraction, the top and the bottom can go in parentheses. I mean, the worst that can happen is that you have two button presses that you didn't really need. There's, there's no cost to using parentheses all the time. The parenthesis button you see down here by the addition 
So it was, let me remind myself, long short-term memory of a goldfish, parentheses, x minus 3, end parenthesis, divided by parenthesis, x plus 1, end parenthesis. And now your calculator will give you the correct graph. This is the correct graph. The previous graph was not. The second thing to know, and I mean, this is a statement about technology as much as it is, uh, you know, graphing in particular, if you're looking at some applied problem, some word problem, your calculator doesn't know with that. And in particular, a lot of real world values must be positive. So we have to be careful with these graphs because their calculator isn't going to know. If you're working with some real world value, that has to be positive. And I mean, when I say this, Comment number two, do you know length, time, um, height, width, revenue, um, percentage of consumers who have um, <clears throat> adopted a new technology, number of people who have heard a rumor, number of people who are sick in an epidemic, number of people born every year. These are variables that have to be positive. I mean, none of those things can be negative. Some variables can be. I mean, temperature. Anyone who who was here in Shadron last December knows that temperatures can certainly be negative. Um, but let's give an example here. That's that R be the radius of a circle and A be the area of a circle and the relationship between these, which you might remember or not, um, but it's A equals pi times the radius squared. So let's graph this on our calculator and let's see what happens. So I mentioned this first of all, but we're not going to be able to enter R squared, and we're not going to have an A over here. It's going to be entered Y equals pi X squared, because our variables are always X and Y on the calculator. Let's take an aside, and for those of us who haven't used these in a while, or have never used them, um, pi. These calculators are color-coded, so I mean, you probably can't see it on the overhead. You can see it if you're working along. But above this caret button, there's a blue pi symbol. And you see there's this blue second button in the upper left. If you press the blue button up here, 
Then if I press this button instead of the carrot, it's going to give me this thing in blue above the carrot. In this case, it's going to give me pi. Pi, the variable button. Again, it's going to be pi x squared. The square button. And we press graph, and we get this parabola coming down, going up. And this graph is good. I mean, it's not incorrect, but it requires some kind of common sense as well. If we trace around this graph, I mean, I can barely see this. I Maybe, oh, maybe, okay, that's slightly better. I wonder if we get rid of the key display. It could be a little bigger still. Okay, that's slightly less awful. I mean, look at, here's a point on the graph. You can see the X and the Y coordinate. I should say the R and the A coordinate down here. And this is telling you that the radius, that when the radius is 0.91, the area is 2.60, rounding to two decimal places. This is telling you that when the radius is 1.52, the area is 7.21. This is telling you that when the radius is negative 1.21, the area is 4.62, but that's a, a meaningless statement because a radius is a distance. It's the distance from the center of the circle to the circle. How could we have a negative distance? So in this, we've got in this graph, and it's good as far as it goes, but we have to recognize that in this geometric situation, A and R both have to be positive. So what's that do to the graph? Well, our calculator gives us something that looks like this. But over here, the radius is negative, and the radius can't be negative. That whole half of the graph has no real world meaning. So, I mean, our calculator is giving us the graph, but it's not recognizing that the radius has to be positive. It's up to us to apply our real world understanding and our common sense to a situation like this. Um, a, a definition, I don't, I mean, you don't really need to know all of this, but the Cartesian plane, we've got these two axes. You notice that it cuts the whiteboard into four pieces. There's one up here, 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 and here. These pieces are called quadrants, and by whatever quirk of history, they're numbered in this way. Um, and you don't need to worry about this for the most part. It's really trigonometry where the quadrants are important. But 
But knowing that this is the first quadrant is kind of useful because if x and y are both positive, which is true in many real world situations, then only the part of the graph in the first quadrant matters. Like if we go back to our calculator, you see there's this graph is in quadrant one, this graph is also in quadrant two. But because A and R, the variables, both have to be positive, this stuff in quadrant two is irrelevant, and only the part of the graph up here matters. Uh, what did I do? I appear to have uh, done something that some there. Okay, it's got it's uh, gone back to normal. Does anybody have any questions so far? Then I warned you that this first lecture, I usually try to keep lectures maybe 30. This first one's probably going to go to 40 minutes. But item three, you might have to adjust the viewing window. And there might be some trial and error involved in this. Let's demonstrate this via an example from the classwork. X will be the time in seconds since a race starts. And Y is going to be the velocity in miles per hour of a certain car. And let's say the relationship between them, I mean, there, there's always a certain amount of unrealistic Sort of, you have to suspend your disbelief a bit that we have these nice formulas, but that say that there is this relationship between them. Y equals 340x divided by x plus 3. And let's take a look on our calculator. Y equals was remember we've got a fraction so I'm going to put the top in parentheses I'm going to put the bottom in parentheses and this is entered correctly I haven't made any mistakes so let's press graph and we don't see anything. Or maybe if you're sitting close enough, you see a, what looks like a vertical blue line. So 
what's going on here? If I didn't make a mistake entering the formula, well, what is going on here? Why aren't we seeing anything? I think uh, Dr. Brust was kind of talking over you, but thank you um, for your answer. Um, so why is velocity? It's the velocity of a race car. And currently, y is going from negative 10 to positive 10. Um, so we're only seeing the part of this graph where the velocity of the car is between negative 10 and 10. And of course, what happens in a race is that the car does not spend a lot of time going 5 or 10 miles per hour. It accelerates past that almost instantly. And once it's accelerated past it, the graphs appear and we can't see it. So if we press the window button, we can make adjustments. We can say, well, the velocity shouldn't be negative. So maybe we let zero be the minimum. More important than that, we get to decide what the maximum we want is. And here's where there's going to be some trial and error because, uh, well, I'm cheating because I've done this example before, but I don't inherently necessarily know how fast a drag racer goes, so I might not know what a good maximum is. Let's, let's say 200 miles per hour. I replaced the 10 with a 200. I pressed the graph, and that doesn't seem to have been high enough. The velocity is still going up above the screen. Maybe 500 miles per hour. So now at least it's not going up above the screen. Um, we're seeing something up here, but velocity has to be positive here, and so does time. So only the first quadrant matters. In fact, we could go to window, and we could say we don't want to look at negative times that start at zero. So, I mean, we're seeing what we would expect to see. The racer accelerates, and um, if we press trace, we can get specific numbers. Um, maybe we want to see a little more of X. We're looking at the first 10 seconds of this race, and again, I'm betraying my own ignorance, but maybe we'd like a race lasts longer than 10 seconds. Maybe we'd like to look at the first three minutes of a race. Three minutes is 180 seconds. So I can go back to window and I can press turn um, X max into 180. And now we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing a picture that makes sense. This velocity starts down here at zero. When the race starts, it accelerates very quickly, but then it approaches a maximum velocity. There's only so fast this thing can go. 
And so the graph kind of evens out. And this is, I mean, if you've, if you've used these graphing calculators before, you might have messed around with Zoom. I always, I feel like I always have terrible luck using Zoom commands. It never seems to give me an actual useful viewing window. So I'm... I've resigned myself to just manually messing around with the window in the window menu. Does anybody have any questions before the work goes out? Call it in classwork. I suspect very few of you are going to finish it in 10 minutes but you can start it. Let me know if you have any questions.